Starting off a little bit, uh, these are um, our presenters today. Me, Darren Thompson, I'm legal counsel from the BC Ministry of Attorney General. I also um, do some teaching at a few different Canadian law schools. And James, over to you. Thanks, Darren. Uh, as it says up there, James Anderson. I'm with uh, with Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Um, been working with the Ministry of uh, Attorney Generals in BC for uh, the last few years, and, and my role has really been the program manager of the the systems that we've been building and uh, responsible for the the delivery and implementation of those. But I'm going to let Darren do uh, most of the talking today, um, and I'll uh, I'll jump in uh, in a few places and happy to answer any questions as we go through as well. So really looking forward to the session. Fantastic. Thanks. So just to start off by uh, turning back the clock a little bit here, um, in here in British Columbia, I've had the good fortune to be involved in a number of online dispute resolution projects. Uh, the ones that I've got up here date back to around 2011. And uh, what was happening then is, is the team that I belonged to had been looking at online dispute resolution for a while. We had um, been studying it and trying to imagine ways that we could apply it to um, more public dispute resolution. So at the time, most of the online dispute resolution work was um, related to e-commerce, uh, eBay and PayPal, of course, are some of the most well-known examples. And for those of you who aren't um, uh, so familiar with the lingo, online dispute resolution, it's kind of hard to define. You'll find different definitions out there depending on where you look, but for me, it's just basically applying technology to a dispute resolution process. It doesn't need to be, by the way, a, a entirely consensual or consent-based dispute resolution or ADR type of things. It can certainly be uh, adversarial adjudicative um, uh, processes and, and everything that leads up to that, including um, negotiation, facilitation or mediation, and so on. So what we did in these smaller uh, experiments again that began in 2011 is we just wanted to go out and try it on some real cases. We didn't want to run a simulation. We didn't want to do a study on the pros and cons. We wanted to actually run real disputes through uh, a system. We partnered up with uh, Modria, which is an online dispute resolution platform provider. They're now part of uh, Tyler Technologies uh, based in the US. And um, we, we, once we figured out that we wanted to try that platform, we had to find some partners to give us some disputes. So the first organization that we linked up with was Consumer Protection BC. And in that case, we um, just did some sort of low volume testing. Uh, we set it up, it was free, it was consent based sort of thing. A, a party would have to opt in, the retailer would have to opt in. And we just ran some disputes through the platform and, and had some good results. Again, I want to emphasize really low volumes. The next organization was somebody called the Property Assessment Appeal Board. They're an administrative tribunal here in British Columbia who was already quite innovative in many ways. Um, they did a lot of their work remotely. And um, they did a lot of alternative dispute resolution. So we decided um, to try it with them. And same idea, low volume. Uh, we just wanted to go out there and get some real cases and some of their applicants or disputants opted into the process and we had some good results. The next thing they did that's relevant for what you're going to see coming up is they set up sort of a front end, an online tool. It was just web pages in that case and it was to help people understand the process and um, get some information about um, their dispute. So uh, in, in this case, it's not just giving straight up information. It was actually answering questions or um, offering questions and giving answers to figure out things like, do I have a strong case? Do I have all the information I need? And so on. So that was connected to sort of a, as an extension on the front end of the online dispute resolution process. And again, low volumes, but um, good results. So what that led to for us here in British Columbia was the development of a much bigger project called the Civil Resolution Tribunal, or the CRT. We passed um, some legislation through in 2011 that authorized the creation of this new tribunal. The uh, jurisdiction of the tribunal is, um, there's two jurisdictions actually. One is strata, what we call strata here, which is a type of condominium ownership. Uh, 
think neighbor disputes, everything from barking dogs to pools to parties to um, big things, expensive things like needing a roof replacement and, and so on on your building. And the other jurisdiction was small claims. So here for us, just uh, to sort of uh, point one thing out, this didn't happen directly within the courts in our case. What we uh, did in the case of the CRT was set up a separate entity or a separate public dispute resolution body that is um, operates as an administrative tribunal. The legislation did um, uh, a lot of things, including making online dispute resolution part of the body of law of British Columbia. It, um, uh, it expressive, expressly made clear that the CRT was going to operate differently than traditional you know, court or justice processes. It, it specified that things would happen asynchronously. That is, uh, parties were not always going to be interacting in real time. It would do things remotely and people could be required to go through um, an online process to sort of screen themselves in and all sorts of um, different things. So the, as I said, the legislation was passed in, uh, in around um, uh, 2011 uh, or 2012. Uh, we've had some amendments since then. And they spent a few years um, after that time uh, working to sort of implement everything from drafting the rules to um, hiring staff to uh, building the technology and, and onboarding it. So in terms of the um, uh, structure of the tribunal, I mentioned that um, in the Property Assessment Appeal Board case, one of our early ODR experiments or pilot projects, there was an online system to screen people in. And that's exactly what we expanded on when the Civil Resolution Tribunal was developed. So the front end of the Civil Resolution Tribunal is, is something called, that we call the Solution Explorer. And what the Solution Explorer is, is it's a type of expert system. And expert systems are basically, it's a technology that is supposed to emulate or emulate the interactions that a person might have with a human expert. In terms of expectation management, I want to be really clear saying this doesn't replace a human expert, but it can provide some of the benefits that we get from human experts. It can reason, it can draw conclusions, and so on. In the case of the um, Solution Explorer, the Civil Resolution Tribunal uses it for diagnosing disputes. Uh, once the diagnosis has been made, it can start to give information about the dispute, information that we think that the, the person with that type of uh, problem or dispute needs. It can give some self-help options, and it can do some streaming or triage. So once it's done some of these things, the diagnosis, information, self-help, it can let the person know where they should go next. And maybe in some cases, if it's a very serious matter, it can say, look, you need really um, you know, urgent sort of help, you should go here right away, that sort of thing. Um, uh, here's the, the, what I'll point out here is, is um, it, it's kind of controversial these days to talk about expert systems in terms of whether they are AI. They, um, I would say it's first wave AI. So um, that being um, very handcrafted rules, it's not a learning system. It doesn't learn on its own. Um, but we have a process where we go out into the world and we talk to human experts, we capture their knowledge and we have a way of, of turning it into rules. Think, think big decision trees. Uh, that forms our knowledge base for the Solution Explorer. And that way we can use that human expertise to deliver it to non-expert users um, through the system. The system is free. If a person comes to use it, they haven't started a case. They haven't paid a fee. Uh, they can do it any time of day or night. And uh, everything we build runs on a mobile phone. If the um, person goes through the Solution Explorer and sort of recognizes they, they do have a dispute that they need to bring to the tribunal for a resolution, that's the next step. We're going to show you uh, a, a little more in depth um, how that process works and what it looks like. But just for now, I'll point out that the um, uh, 
The process for starting your dispute with the Civil Resolution Tribunal, making your application, again, is remote. And um, there's a real mix of the ways that people can um, interact. A lot of it happens online. We, um, when, the, when these technologies were built, we assumed that this was going to be the number one preferred sort of channel that people will use. It's turned out to be true, but there are, as we'll talk about in a minute, other ways um, to get in there. So this is just the idea. I don't know if, if any of you have read any of Richard Susskind's books, but he asks that question of whether uh, court is a service or a place. Um, we think it can. It, it's good to really focus on the service in our case. We um, the service we provide is um, dispute resolution, and we don't really need a, a place uh, strictly to do that. So, what I will say, though, ironically, is um, the it's building through the technology-based channels has, has enabled us to link the tribunal to link with more front counters than we actually have with our courts. So our courts have 44 full-time locations in BC, uh, but when the, based on the way the Civil Resolution Tribunal was designed, it can link with um, Service BC, which are sort of um, catch-all government service outlets, and there are 62 locations uh, through the province. So that's one of the interesting things is we actually managed, we surprised ourselves and managed to link it up with more front counters uh, than we'd had before. It's really tempting, especially for those of us who are excited about technology and the ways that it can improve justice processes to get carried away and just talk about technology and it becomes the whole technology project sort of thing. We, we did our best for the, the team who worked on this tribunal did its best to avoid um, getting drawn into that vortex of hey, this is a big tech project, and really tried to focus on users. We, we knew that building a technology that um, had hundreds of thousands of functions that we thought were great and that um, we thought justice processes require um, was probably end up being something that nobody wanted to use. So what we managed to do was um, sort of self-regulate a little bit, train ourselves. We got lots of help from um, sort of a multidisciplinary, um, uh, building a multidisciplinary team with people, lots of people with technology uh, background, but also user experience design and so on. And to help us uh, figure out a way to, to build technology that um, people would be able to use, maybe in some cases they would actually want to use and um, always throughout keep users at the center. So we went out and consulted, we did surveys and, uh, uh, of the public, we did online focus groups to learn about small businesses, for example, what they wanted out of a dispute resolution process and how they prefer to re resolve disputes and so on. We would go back, our team would conceptualize it and sort of sketch it out. We would consult again ask people, you know, would you use something like this if we built it? We would get a little more into designing and so on and so forth. So we would prototype things, you know, just build them with web pages or um, um, sort of visual designs and so on, keep consulting, building, and we haven't stopped. So um, James, this might be a good place for you to jump in and just talk about how the, uh, um, the technology work is still ongoing. They're still building for yeah, the tribunal and, and, um, and how that from, from an agile perspective if you're weaving the, this approach in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, um, this idea of, uh, of being user-centric and continuously improving has really driven um, everything that we've done, both as, as Darren says, in terms of conceptualizing what we should build, but actually through the development and delivery cycles, um, we actually continue to, to continuously consult, build, um, assess, change if need be. Um, so we've, we've established a very kind of agile um, project team. Um, for the last 18 months, we've been rolling out new software features every three weeks, um, which is actually fantastic for both um, the Civil Resolution Tribunal, but also citizens, because as we're exposing uh, more and more features and more system functionality, we get, you know, we get feedback from staff, um, we get feedback from citizens, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that um, in a few more slides, um, to actually say whether or not things are working. Um, and that, that work is ongoing, and, and we see, uh, you know, we've got, you know, many months left to, uh, to get things finished for the CRT, but we'll continue to um, keep this agile methodology rolling where we really do um, take that feedback in real time and use it to improve things, not, not in months or years, but, you know, 
in a couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, I think we will, we will talk a bit more about what we're doing with some of that data um, that we get back later on. Fantastic. Thanks. So here's the ugly truth. If you just want to have a takeaway here is, um, and this is what Sh Shannon Salter, who's the chair of the civil resolution tribunal, you'll, you'll hear her say, um, uh, Having a, a bunch of lawyers and tech people sit around the table, they're not always going to make the best decisions of what users need. So um, this is why we need to go out and talk to our users and talk to them often. So one of the, th one of the um, sort of questions, challenges, issues, concerns that comes up um, in, in many discussions around using technology to improve access to justice is what about the digital divide? Um, what about the people who are unwilling or unable to use technology to access a justice process? It's something that we take very seriously. Um, we do think it's a it, it is a big issue. It it deserves it, um, you know focus and attention. But um, what I want to tell you is the 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 way the CRT has sort of dealt with that or addressed that is by not simply focusing on one technology channel or one technology, but building across uh, multiple channels. So as I mentioned earlier, technology, you know, the, the internet, um, accessing, accessing the services through the internet has turned out to be the biggest and, and uh, channel. It's the richest channel. It's the one that we can do the most with. Um, we can serve people very quickly and so on. But it's not the only channel. So the Civil Resolution Tribunal also pulls in um, telephone. It, it, it can switch back and forth between internet and telephone for some users. Even if we're just looking at internet, by the way, that could be logging in through a portal and looking at something like you would look at a website. But it also can include email. So you, you can... Um, they can split across channels. We do it as people. We do it all the time anyways, um, mix these channels. And um, that's exactly what the tribunal can do. So it can, it can handle paper documents. Um, it can do mail. It can, um, it can even have in-person meetings if it needs to or in-person hearings. But um, the idea here is to build the channels in a way so that they all work as seamlessly as possible together. What I will say with the, um, the sort of survey work we did and talking to the public before things, uh, before we started building, w was we recognized that there was gonna be a relatively small number of people who were going to be unwilling or unable to use technology. So that meant that we could build those offline processes to be pretty high touch. And by that, I mean, they, they don't have to be, um, uh, you know, as scalable and as well built out a, as we might have thought, because they're not going to be used very much. So the tribunal can serve those people, you know, quite hands on and knowing that most people are not going to be asking to be served that way. So it's just one way. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a firm believer that in terms of the digital divide, um, it's not something that anybody who's who's using technology to for access to justice can actually solve, but there are ways to handle it, and and uh, working across multiple channels is is definitely working well so far. This is a look at what the CRT's dispute resolution process looks like. We're going to look at the Solution Explorer in a minute. Um, as I as I said, it was it's where the diagnosis information self help happens. If the person gets through that and um, needs to start an application, ask the tribunal for help for resolution, They um, that happens between the number one and number two spot here on the slide. They file their application, uh, it gets screened into the tribunal, and then they have to give the other parties and the dispute notice, and um, then, then we can start um, the dispute resolution process. What happens, um, one of the first activities is an online discussion, online negotiation to see if the parties can resolve it just by talking to each other. They may not have, have interacted with each other yet. This is to sort of take the cream of the cases out of the system that only need a tiny little bit of help to um, reach a resolution by agreement. If that doesn't work, then a facilitator comes on from the tribunal. It's very much like a mediation like many of you might be familiar with, where um, it's a neutral third party who's working with the disputants to see if they can uh, resolve 
all of the issues, or if not, at least resolve some of the issues. If, and, and by the way, again, that happens, um, that can happen across multiple channels. So imagine we're getting our information together through asynchronous sort of technology-based channel and the facilitator says, you know what, I think I want to get um, everybody together on the telephone on Thursday afternoon at 2.30 for 45 minutes, they can go ahead and uh, arrange that. If the facilitator can't um, uh, help the parties reach a resolution of all the claims or issues in the dispute, then the emphasis of the facilitation phase turns to preparing the parties for um, an adjudicative or the decision process. And the idea is to make sure we have all the information ready. We want to make sure everybody's clear on what the issues are. We want to make sure the issues are as narrow as possible so that when that decision phase or the adjudication phase starts, that um, it will go as efficiently as possible. We don't want to have a lot of people, you know, having to start over and, and uh, interrupt the process and um, so on. After that, the, um, the, tr the tribunal can make a decision. They can, um, resolving any issues the parties were unable to resolve themselves, and uh, they can make orders to give effect to that decision. And then the parties, at least here in the BC example, can um, go off and file those with the court in the court enforcement process and, and try and enforce enforce them that way. Of course, the key here is to avoid uh, trying to um, uh, rely too heavily on the decision and order um, uh, resolution uh, approach because we um, believe that if the parties can resolve the disputes by agreement, they're more likely to uphold them. So we have a, a question. How does the CRT address sophisticated and large actors like debt collectors? Yeah, it's a it's a tr um, tricky s sort of question. It's a, it's a it's a really or a challenge. It's a, it's a good one, and of course. So we have you know the unsophisticated um, debtor up against the sophisticated party who does this thing all the time. The um, the CRT d does. I've I've heard I've heard them say they do try to level the playing field where they can, but of course there are limits as to how far they can go. I I would say that one of the biggest um, a couple of a couple of things that might influence, you know, or or support that um, that effort is th the facilitators often have um, some familiarity with the subject matter. So, for example, in our condo dispute um, uh, process, uh, the facilitators will know a little bit about that process, so they can kind of. Um, uh, again, I don't want to suggest anything that's inappropriate, but they can kind of focus the parties in and make sure everybody knows exactly what they should be talking about and, and narrow it that way to sort of um, avoid, you know, one party leveraging just the process and procedure against the other one. Uh, a second point is that the CRT as a tribunal is, is much, um, it's, it's more informal than a court. So hopefully the parties will focus on the subject matter rather than again on um, trying to figure out how to navigate just the procedure, which we understand is, is uh, something that defeats a lot of self-represented litigants in, in court processes. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll say about this is that um, a lot of, insofar as these interactions are not real time, uh, the litigant who needs a little more help can go off and try and get it. I'm not, again, saying that they're definitely going to get the help they need, but at least they have a chance. Um, maybe they can look something up, do a little bit of research, and uh, just to respond to a question or take the next step. So it's a big challenge. Um, I don't think anybody's got it solved yet, but it's certainly something the tribunal is, is concerned with. What's our next question, Kat? Okay, we have a lot of questions. So now he's saying, so most of the cases are done online and a very few options are done with the phone. So I guess to extend that out, like, I assume most of them online, but like, how does it break down with online versus phone versus other uh, ways of using yeah. the system? Uh, yeah, good question. Sorry, I don't have the data. Um, I'll, I'll in in I think uh, shortly we'll we'll show you a little bit of data about the the sort of channels and and selection. But I don't. I'm not even sure the the tribunal itself um, tracks how often they switch 
um, between channels within within a certain dispute. I po- apologize for that. No, that's totally okay. Let's let, let's take one more, uh, and then and then we'll keep we'll keep going uh, because some of the questions may end up sort of being uh, spoken to as as we go along. But these are good questions. Okay. Yeah. Have, we, um, have we got one more? Well, one more. Um, are the CCRTs court employees or independent contractors? Uh, there's actually a, a mix. Most of them are employees of, of the tribunal. Uh, I think they can um, draw on additional help on a contract basis when they need it. But um, the uh, the basic model is that the um, resolution support clerks, as they're called, and the facilitators um, are employees of of the tribunal and uh, public servants, and the uh, adjudicators, which in in our context be called tribunal members, uh, they're appointed as um, either on a full-time or a part-time basis. So the um, there are a small number of uh, full-time uh, tribunal members, including the chair, and there's a, two vice chairs, and I think there's another full-time member. And the rest of the tribunal members are um, paid sort of on a, on a part-time or a per diem sort of basis. A lot of them are um, pretty senior lawyers who practice in these areas and um, they log in, so to speak, to the tribunal and do their work uh, when their services are needed. So thanks for those questions. So let's um, jump in here. I want to show uh, everyone the Solution Explorer. I want you to have a look at it. Uh, It's best to work with um, a use case, which in this case, I just um, uh, put one uh, quickly together. And uh, so we'll let Sarah help us. She has uh, a busy family. She's like many of us and a, and a normal sort of Monday to Friday job. Um, she was uh, had been looking for a nice uh, big fancy fridge to fit into her newly renovated kitchen and uh, found one that she'd been looking for. It was from a retailer that she kind of had some reservations about, but the price looked really good. So she went for it and ordered it, made the arrangements, and it never arrived. So now Sarah, like many um, self-represented litigants, is is wondering what she can do next. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to jump into um, the Civil Resolution Tribunal's website. Uh, this is, um, I've actually um, gone ahead in into um, the page. Here, maybe I'll jump back. Sorry, everybody. When you get to the Civil Resolution Tribunal website, you can a user can read a little bit about the tribunal and, and how it works and so on, and they can watch a video, which I won't show here, about the Solution Explorer. I think it's about two minutes and 30 seconds long. I welcome you to um, take a look at it uh, after the session. Uh, but when they're ready, the person can click uh, Get Started. So um, again, just a little bit of information. You can see here that the, the website um, Big on white space, small on text, hopefully. It's very easy to, to um, add a lot of text. They um, certainly worked hard to, to just sort of take more of a, uh, a minimalist approach, and just tell people um, what they need. Let's say uh, Sarah has uh, had a look at this, and she's decided that she's, um, she's got a small claim. And now she's going to get into, um, just about to go into the Solution Explorer. So, what she can do is look at the different types of um, disputes, the way that the they're divided up across the domain. So again, our small claims domain is quite a broad civil domain. It, it includes a lot of different dispute types. So Sarah is going to jump into the um, buying and selling goods and services. So again, she can read a little bit about here. Um, she can look at some information on limitation periods. She can learn how, you know, what, what, um, information she should gather and so forth. I'll apologize to you guys. I'm going to be going very quickly through this. I'm not going to be able to let you read everything. I'll just want to show you um, basically the functions of, about how it works and um, in the system. So she, uh, Sarah clicks um, goods and services buyers and she clicks start. So here's a good example of a screen I won't let you read uh, today, but it is the um, terms of use. So Uh, Sarah can go ahead and take a look at that on her own time, agree, and continue. The next thing we see is a question about whether or not you're on a public or a private computer. And 
The uh, public computer would be examples we could think of as like if you go into a public library and use one of their terminals and so on. The system's set up so that it won't let you download any information to um, to that machine, and it will also time you out a little faster, time your session out. But Sarah is uh, she's using her cell phone, or maybe she's using her laptop at home one night, and she goes ahead and uh, clicks start. So this is. Um, what a lot of the screens in the Solution Explorer look like. So we're now into um, well into the platform. Uh, again, just remember I told you before, it's an expert system. It's supposed to sort of emulate or imitate the interactions you might have with a human expert. What we're going to see here is questions that the user reads and then just answers about their circumstances or their situation. So, um, that's the basic premise of how the system works. It's how we, um, what's what's happening in the background here. We don't remember, we don't need our users to know all this, but what's happening in the background is we're starting to sort of navigate through the knowledge base based on those rules that we set up in the knowledge base. And uh, the knowledge bases can be quite big. The um, strata or the condo um, version of this that we use has, um, it's well, I think it's 3,400 different pathways you can go down. So the knowledge base really can get big. Um, we have the methodology to capture that and put it into the system. So a um, couple of other features here. We've got the progress bar. That's pretty standard. What we have here is an access code. So it's a alpha unique alphanumeric code that Sarah can send to herself. So she can, um, if she needs to take a break and go and get a document or do something with her kids or whatever, she can go away and then she can come back within a 32-day 32, 32 period, uh, put in the code and um, she'll pick up where she left off. So uh, we've tried to make it so that um, people can step away if, if they need to. And there are a few other things. There's uh, something broken um, link. People can um, tell the tribunal uh, if, if they think something's not working, they can ask for a reply and so on. There's also a point here where a user, if they're seeing a question and they think the answer that they wanted to give or they think the answer that, they, that should be there isn't there, they can go ahead and click that and uh, send a message to the tribunal. And um, at, on the tribunal side, they can um, try and um, figure out what's missing and uh, what needs to be done. So let's get back to Sarah. She bought that uh, fridge, remember, for her kitchen. So she's going to answer this question for personal, family, or household use. We tried to make these sorts of questions very simple. Um, this actually deals with quite a complex issue from uh, a consumer, um, a legal sort of consumer law perspective here in British Columbia. Um, this still means that the consumer protection legislation here in British Columbia would apply. It wouldn't um, be the same if she said it was for business use. So once she clicks the answer, she just clicks next. And in this case, we see another question. So what's happening here is we're starting that problem diagnosis. We've gone from the very broad small claims domain into a buying and selling sort of um, domain and now we're narrowing it even more to say okay this has to do with a consumer and um, we're still trying to um, give simple questions to our user but again this is a pretty complex issue behind the scenes from a legal perspective we're just saying was the seller in the business of selling that good or service well Sarah bought it from Acme Appliances so she answers yes because they are in the business it wasn't as, it wasn't at a garage sale or anything like that now we're asking Sarah what she bought. So I really just want you to imagine here the decision tree running in the background, the different pathways and so on. We're really, st again, narrowing in on that diagnosis. Each of these sort of answers leads to its own unique set of pathways that would give um, different diagnosis, different information tools and, st and streaming and so on. So this wasn't travel, it wasn't a funeral service, it wasn't a prepaid purchase card, it was something else. So that's what Sarah answers and clicks next. What we're getting at into this point here is the first sort of information resource. And um, so what's happened here is we've done enough diagnosis that we can start to give our user basic information about the 
the problem or this area. This can do a lot of things. It can give you, you know, here's what you should do first sort of uh, um, guidance. It can say, um, here's what you shouldn't do. It can um, just sort of explain to the person how this all works. It can give uh, general expectations of what a reasonable outcome might look like and, and so on. This is all collected through our knowledge engineering process where we go out and work with human subject matter experts. They're the ones who feed us this information. Our knowledge engineering team figures out how to put it in the right format so that we can uh, work through it in the system. So this sets out a bunch of different um, uh, bits of information. We try and do it in bite-sized chunks about uh, the type of problem that Sarah is having. Again, I'll apologize. I'm going to be going too quickly for you to read it today. One thing as well I'll point out here is our user can also rate the um, using the, the star rating system. They can rate whether they like it or not. It's a way for us to capture some or collect some user feedback in line rather than giving people a survey at the end. Sarah can also click the not helpful button which uh, will record a not helpful press that our team looks at in terms of the analytics. And uh, if we get, of course, too many not helpful clicks on a resource, we have to go in there and try and um, see if we can make some improvements. So let's click next in Sarah's case. And we're continuing the diagnosis here of her problem. This next question, what's the issue uh, with what you bought? Well, in, in Sarah's case, it was a problem with quality or delivery. So remember her fridge uh, didn't arrive. You can see just scanning quickly the, uh, the other types of problems that Sarah might have had. The system would have its own way of addressing each of those um, individually. I'll just point out too that what we're doing is uh, building, the system is building sort of a breadcrumb trail trail along the side. If Sarah gets to a point where she's thinking that she might have ended up in the wrong place, she can just go back and uh, give a different answer and it'll take her down a different pathway. Now we've, uh, again, just think about how we've narrowed this, this uh, problem from the full small claims domain right down into a buyer and seller. We know it's a consumer. We know it's a problem with quality or delivery. And now we're just um, um, continuing to go. So we can go as granular as we need to on the diagnosis. And uh, again, this is um, something that we, our knowledge engineers, uh, figure out with this, the subject matter experts how granular or narrow we need to go. And in this case, Sarah says that the fridge wasn't delivered um, or the uh, service, if it was a service, wasn't completed. So again, reasonable expectations. We don't want to rush people into, okay, get ready for a big adversarial court process or decision process. We want people to sort of um, know what a, a human expert might say, somebody who deals with these sorts of problems all the time. Um, here are some reasons why the um, thing that you ordered hasn't been delivered yet, and it's even giving some sort of guidance about you know steps the person can take uh, to deal with that. But at this point, we're also recognizing that the person's probably going to have to look at their um, contract or their invoice or their receipt. So um, giving the user a little bit of information about that and um, all of the information that we write in this, we have a style guide that we've created. We try and target a sixth to eighth grade literacy level. Uh, we don't always hit it, but we sure try hard to do it and um, try and uh, you know, restrict the information to just what the user, just what we think the user needs to know. So now we're asking Sarah, um, what's a pretty simple question for her? Did you buy goods or did you buy services? Again, there's a really sticky legal issue that's in behind this and that's why we're asking the question, but we try and just make it simple for her. So she bought um, goods, that was her fridge. And the, here's um, sort of a light treatment of that very sticky issue. We have some legislation here in British Columbia uh, called the Sale of Goods Act, and um, it may also apply. So you can see here, we're trying to give our user a little bit of an impression about what some of uh, the rights and obligations might be in this area, and um, hopefully, again, uh, limiting it to things that might be useful uh, for a user. So we've done the diagnosis, the problem diagnosis, we've given some information about it. Now we're shifting into the um, self-help sort of phase. So here we're asking Sarah which solution she would like to 
um, explore. Uh, as I mentioned, let me let me go back to Sarah. She was um, a little bit nervous about that retailer. It didn't have a great reputation, but um, the price looked good. So that's why she tried it. Now she's realizing maybe that um, it wasn't the best bet for her. And she just wants to be done with Acme appliances. So she's going to ask the seller for her refund. So that's the option she takes and she clicks next. What we have here is that it's really the most common self-help tool that the system provides, and it is a letter template or a communication template. So what would happen here is Sarah would go ahead, she can use the sort of wizard style approach and, uh, and, and start to fill it out that way, and it'll populate the letter. I'm just going to um, jump to step two, which will give everybody a bit of a better view of what this, this looks like. Um, what it is, is it's, uh, it's a, again, a, a letter or a communication template that is customized for this user's problem. So if you can imagine in the knowledge base for the Solution Explorer, there are um, lots of these in there and they are customized in many cases based on the diagnosis of the person's problem. So in Sarah's case, she had a problem with goods that aren't delivered. So if we had taken the time to um, go through all the questions, we would have filled in, you know, here's where she would reference the fridge, here's where she would reference the purchase date and so on. And um, it's saying, remember Sarah said that she wanted to get a refund. That's exactly what this letter says. So this is where the subject matter experts that we work with would tell us what the letter needs to say. And we would go ahead and design it and, and put it in a certain format so that the system could deliver it to our user. So I'm going to go to step three here. What the system, the way it's currently set up, it doesn't save any personal information. So um, what we would have Sarah do is email a copy to herself. So she'd get the digital copies that, of that letter or um, she could download it as a PDF since she's on a, a private computer or um, print it. You're going to see a warning here. Again, we don't want our user to get upset. Uh, because the system is not going to save the information. So that's what the second warning's for. And she goes ahead and clicks next. Now we have um, uh, a workbook for negotiating, um, negotiating a solution. So if, for those of you who work in the ADR area, some of this will be familiar. Um, identify your goals, be creative, take a problem solving approach, um, and so on. So there's um, uh, that's another resource we give to our user in this case. And um, now we're asking what the value of the dispute is. And this is because if Sarah will go on to file a, um, a dispute with the tribunal, this will affect the fee. There's a slightly higher uh, fee or lower fee depending on the value in dispute. So Sarah's uh, fridge was uh, $2,500. So she selects that So and uh, clicks next. So this just signifies that she is nearing the end of her um, exploration through the Solution Explorer. Some of the pathways we set up, we didn't see it in this one, but some of the pathways we set up, you can select multiple aspects of a dispute and explore each of them in turn. But we only went down a single pathway for Sarah. Now we've reached her summary report. So here's her code. The, this is telling Sarah it'll save it for 32 days. If she comes in before the 32 days is up, it starts the clock again, so it'll keep saving it. We've got a natural language summary. Okay, Sarah, based on what you told us, you bought uh, or agreed to buy goods. You have an issue with delivery. You want to ask the seller for a refund. Here are the resolution tools that, you, um, that we showed you. Those are all down here. Again, there's the letter if Sarah wanted to see it again and keep working on that and, and our warning and some of the info resources that we showed her, they're all still here collected in her summary report and the breadcrumb trail and so on. So she got, if she gets to the end and she tries all of that and wants to keep going in into the tribunal process, she would click this button right here. So this is where the sort of streaming comes in. We don't want a user, user to have to go away and go somewhere else and look up a bunch of different websites and so on. We tried to build the um, Solution Explorer and the Civil Resolution Tribunal so that once you start down that Solution Explorer pathway, you're in the right place. You don't need to decide. Um, you don't need to, get, to take on another problem of figuring out where to go. So all Sarah would do would 
um, would be clicking the start process button and uh, it would take her into the intake, which we're going to show you some screens in uh, just a minute here, but it would basically start the intake process right into the tribunal. So that was the Solution Explorer. I'm just noticing the time here. We're gonna, I'm going to speed up a little bit because um, I do want to leave some time for, for questions. Uh, really quickly, this is some of the, it's just a snapshot, you won't be able to read it, of sort of the dashboards that we get out of the Solution Explorer. So as you can imagine, um, there, there is a, a, a lot of really great analytics sort of data that, that comes out of it. We can see um, you know, what's happening out there in the world with our users. What kind of problems are people saying they're having and how do those compare in terms of volumes to other problems that the system handles and so on. If you use technology as the backbone for your, your justice services or your access to justice services, it's in many cases going to be collecting this stuff automatically. So it's a, it's a huge advantage over um, more traditional ways of doing it. Um, the um, Early numbers, like these are these are some of the initial numbers. Like to give you to to give you an example, so we've had over eleven thousand. The the tribunal has had over eleven thousand explorations on the small claims side. Uh, it based on those eleven thousand, the top three types of um, sort of big bucket disputes that come through are buyers, sellers, and then the third highest is property. So there's an example of an insight that we get from this data that we would not have anticipated. We would have picked something like personal injury or employment. I'm pretty sure uh, we would not have selected property as um, one of the top domains. The top issues, I mean, you can start to drill down deeper into that. Um, the, one of the top issues was a person bought goods or services for personal family or household use. That's the one we looked at with Sarah. So there are 231 sort of people who explored um, that or 231 explorations down that pathway and so on. And we can see the claim values that people are identifying uh, as they go through. So we get a chance to collect this data again before people have actually gone to the tribunal. A lot of these people might never go to the tribunal. They'll never pay the fee. They'll never start the file. But we still, um, by using the Solution Explorer to, to sort of extend the service out into the world, we still get a chance to collect uh, this information and learn about what's happening. So the Solution Explorer is um, sort of built as its own module. It's, um, it connects to a second module that's called the Dispute Resolution Suite. And just before we get into the, um, so giving you a quick look at some of those screens, so you can see what the tribunal looks like. I'll ask James if you want to jump in here and uh, let anybody know any, anything from an architecture perspective. Uh, thanks, Darren. I mean, the I guess the takeaway here is, as you mentioned, we've, we've built the Solution Explorer and the Dispute Resolution Suite as um, modular applications. So they can work seamlessly with each other. They can work independently um, or they can actually through, I mean, they're built on open standards and are all API based. So they can connect with other modern case management systems or intake systems. Um, but as Darren mentioned in the demo of the Solution Explorer, when you get to that point where you know that you want to file a formal dispute and actually get into some uh, some negotiation or potentially facilitation, um, that's when you would actually go and do the uh, the intake and you would start a case that would would appear in the dispute resolution suite, which is... Let me jump ahead here, James. You can actually yeah. show that. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you've got some, some screens of this. So this is... Um, I mean, we're not going to jump into the, the DRS software because it will, will take a long time to show you, but we just thought we'd show a few screens. Um, so the Solution Explorer, the way we've configured it, actually will take an applicant to the right place to, to lodge their application formally. Um, they be asked a series of questions. Um, these intake forms can be as simple um, or as complex as a, a tribunal or a court wants them to be. Um, but the types of things we've, we're going to be asking now are to actually, um, you know, list uh, personal details, um, representative details if applicable, um, respondents' details, um, nature and details of the dispute, um, any evidence that's associated with the dispute that, uh, that a, uh, a disputant may want to um, file at intake. Um, and this is, uh, the, the DRS will actually take them through payment. Um, in the case of BC, we link to um, British Columbia Express Pay, which is the, the government payment system. Um, and this is really what what this actually does is um, it, it kind of does data entry for the tribunal. So um, what we're actually asking citizens to do 
is enter the details of the dispute. Um, and this creates a case um, in the DRS, which has all of that information contained. So there's no rework, there's no paper form that needs to be um, kind of retranslated into the system. This actually um, creates the case and all of the, the rules associated with it automatically. So, so, so some of the points here too is uh, for any of you who've spent any time designing court forms, uh, it can be hard to design a court form. I, I know I've spent, I've worked on hundreds of them myself to, to capture all of the sort of circumstances, different yeah. users, different information. What you can see here on that one screen that says what, who is applying, um, there's a radio button clicked that says, are you a person? They could have clicked, are you an organization or business? And or the one that you can't see is a strata corporation, that sort of thing. Depending on which radio button is clicked there, the fields all change on the form. So, I mean, it's pretty simple. It seems straightforward. Of course you would do it this way, but that's not the way we've done it normally on forms. Uh, so here, depending on what you say you are, the fields all change. So it only is, it's only gonna ask you the information you need. You don't need to figure out um, what, which ones you're supposed to answer, which ones you're not supposed to answer. And as James said, that's huge for me. I used to work in um, our court services branch where we've got legions of, of um, registry staff who are data entering documents into the electronic uh, case management system. The users, the users are doing it here for for the tribunal. So this is not just the front end, but it's the same system as the back end that the staff uses. So as the user enters, this information is going to the database. That's a great point, Darren. And I think if, for example, a paper form did come in and we were filing that way, um, a staff member would use this exact same form to actually enter the data. So it really is the, the single place. Um, and a practical example of what you're saying about reducing forms, and I know we're, we're short on time, but one of the appellant-based tribunals we're working with in BC um, had 14 different intake forms, um, and now they have one um, that kind of responds to what a, what a citizen is inputting and um, asks them the right questions based on their information. So let's jump ahead and see some of these other screens. Um, wh wh what the system also does the way it's set up is to be um, uh, uh, not just a form, but also like a workflow management tool. So it helps to keep um, the dispute moving along. It can do some of it automatically if there are business rules built into the system. It knows when to do something or it knows when to notify somebody, whether it's a, it's a disputant or whether it's a, a staff member. Uh, that something needs to happen because it, you know a timeline is timed out or something. But it can also um, uh, build instructions. And so uh, this, the, the Simple Resolution Tribunal does have rules. It, it's got its own set of rules of procedure. But um, wherever possible, what we, the team has tried to do is build the instructions and um, into the form of guidance right into the software. So here you can see a screen where um, we're asking the user, what do you want to do? And um, in this case, it has to do with um, um, the notice process. So I say I'm a claimant and I've had to serve notice of a dispute to James and to um, you know, Acme appliances and so on. And here's where it's just saying, okay, just tell us what you want to do. And it's going to guide um, the user through those sorts of processes. It's just, just one small example, but um, this is where we know self-represented litigants really get tripped up is a lot of the um, the nuts and bolts sorts of uh, procedural steps that maybe for a lawyer or a paralegal or another type of advocate are straightforward because they've done it hundreds of times, but for the person who's only going to have one dispute in their life that, that, that goes like this, it can be really scary. So um, this is another way um, we think it can sort of help um, uh, people focus just on, on the dispute and just on uh, reaching a resolution. This is a look at the um, online negotiation uh, screen. It is, uh, again, pretty straightforward. And a, lo a lot of that, the reason for that too is because we need all of these um, uh, um, screens to work on mobile devices and, and uh, things like tablets and phones as well as a computer, but um, it's pretty straightforward again too. There's an advantage to building technology uh, that looks like looks like stuff people are used to using already. So um, 
they can go ahead and, and the parties can um, negotiate in here. It's also, I think it looks very similar for the facilitation phase, if I'm not mistaken, right, James, when a third party or third party neutrals come on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, in that case, you would see, um, you know, a facilitator and the various parties all being able to use asynchronous chat to, to talk to one another. Fantastic. Okay. So, and let's jump ahead here. This is what the user might see uh, when they um, say they've gone through the negotiation, they've gone through the facilitation. There's at least one claim or issue that's still remaining that the parties just can't resolve by agreement. Now we need to get ready to go into the uh, decision process. So it's um, letting the parties know that that's what's going to happen. And uh, in this case, it's getting them to asking each party to go through their information and um, with a sort of a, a warning about not letting any negotiation or settlement discussions come through to that adversarial adjudicative phase because we don't want the decision maker to see that. Uh, James, I'll let you talk to the, uh, the dashboards. Thanks, Darren. Um, so as Darren showed that uh, the Solution Explorer data earlier and how we're tracking that, I mean, the, the point I just wanted to, to get to here was um, we also track um, data, different things out of the, the use of the dispute resolution suite. Um, and what that is really there to do is to drive our continuous improvement and to uh, make changes that benefit both the CRT and citizens. And um, the practical example of that, that that we're currently doing at the moment um, is that the CRT is finding that a, a large number, well, more disputes than they expected go through to default decision or default judgment because either notice is never served or a respondent never responds. Um, and doing those default judgments actually takes up a lot of staff time. So we're now going back and using the information that we captured over the last, um, last eight months to rework a couple of fields in the intake form, um, automate the default judgment process to actually free up a bunch of staff time and let them deal with the, the active disputes where they've got um, two parties that are in negotiation or in, in mediation. So, um, I mean, as you would expect of a, of a modern system, we can we can basically track and report on any data that is, is captured in the system. Um, so I won't spend too much more time on, on that slide. Thanks, Darren. What I'll, thanks, James. What I'll say is the, um, what, what, what from an administrator's perspective here, um, you, it's, a, it's real time. And uh, so you can see what's happening anytime. So what, at least from my own experiences working in the justice system, what we would normally do in court is go in and do an evaluation. And that would be sort of a snapshot, one time, sort of you know collect all the information, compile it, analyze it, and so on. Those are very helpful. Uh, I encourage people who work in courts to still do that. But this is a little different because we can see real time. We can see what's happening now and then we can see what's happening in, in a month. And th that helps you uh, in many ways, including watching trends, because the trends sometimes I think are, that, are, are what we're going to find, um, tell, tell the big stories and, and, um, and d deserve our attention. In terms of some of the early data, this is... Um, uh, I focus mostly on the small claims uh, here, but and and remember, it's unique to to BC and our population, and and the current jurisdiction of the tribunal is uh, for small claims only goes up to five thousand uh, dollars. But the um, you can see some of the numbers: twenty three hundred filed, uh, seven hundred resolved. Uh, the vast majority of those are uh, resolving by agreement, so they don't need to go to the decision making phase, um, the adjudicative phase. We've had um, fewer eight, uh, strata or condo disputes filed, although that, ju that jurisdiction's been in force for um, almost a year more than the small claims um, data. So the um, one thing, sorry, so, somebody may be typing there with a mic on. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, you, James, or, or Kat. Um, so access time. So just in terms of, again, is, is court or a service or a place? Take a look here, you know, 45%, almost half of the people are using the tribunal's tools outside of normal court working hours. So think about Sarah, who has a Monday to Friday job and she has the busy family. She's racing around all over the place. Um, she can do a lot of this work outside normal hours. And that's certainly what we're finding uh, for users so far based on the data. 
In terms of the format, uh, we've had three, the tribunal has had three people out of 3,000 applications that it's received who have requested to not use email. So if email is sort of the, uh, the, the sort of, is it going to be digital? Is it not going to be digital sort of indicator? Uh, it's been three out of uh, 3,000 who've, um, who've requested to use something other than email. So the tribunal has a way to, as I mentioned earlier, work across different channels and they can accommodate uh, those users' needs. And about, uh, uh, say, out of 350 to 400 applications that are coming through each month, uh, about five might come in on a paper form. So the numbers are quite low. I, I appreciate some of us might recognize that there's some sort of people self-select for the tribunal based on whether or not they're using um, uh, technology and computers. But in any event, I just want to be clear that you, there are ways to serve people um, across those different channels without using um, strictly using technology, but the numbers uh, are turning out to be quite low. The... Um, the tribunal, one thing that it does in, in terms of, we'd mentioned continuous improvement. Um, we showed you the ways that we solicit feedback in the Solution Explorer um, from our users. Uh, here's a, just a snapshot at a survey that the tribunal, for anybody who goes through the tribunal process, uh, once they're finished, the, the tribunal gives them this survey and asks them questions about how it went. So um, this is some of the early data. It's looking really strong. Everybody's really excited about it. 90% of people felt they were treated fairly. 82% found the process easy to understand and 80% and found the, the process intuitive. Um, rather than focusing just on the data here though that the CRT is, has collected, um, I just ask everybody to focus on the on the point or the idea of asking users, surveying users when they've gone through a justice process, how it went for them. If we do want to build um, processes and that, that are accessible and that do focus on users and put, the, put them at the center of everything we do, I think this is a really effective way to, um, to get us there to support those efforts is we, we have to ask. We have to ask our users whether it's working um, for them. I have been at some conferences and meetings and so on where um, courts have indicated that this, this is not something they're prepared to do or they um, somehow perceive it as a, a threat to judicial independence. I'm not really sure um, how will those arguments work, but um, I think there are ways of doing it um, where you could avoid some of those issues. The one thing you really have to prepare for from a cultural perspective is the possibility you're going to hear things that you don't want to hear. Um, and um, but that's a necessary step in uh, figuring out what the problems are and then turning to ways to address them. If we don't do it, we're, we're never going to get there. Just overall, in terms of the approach and the shifts that we're, we're, um, our team has been um, fortunate to, to work on, the, um, if you think about it in terms of the dispute resolution continuum, um, we really pick up with the Solution Explorer, at least, as a dispute containment, I like to think, sort of um, approach. So remember, we, so we showed Sarah the letter template. We showed her some things she could do, review her contract. We showed her reasons why, in her case, her problem might have happened, so why an item might not have been delivered yet. Um, setting those sort of reasonable expectations. Maybe she doesn't really have the problem that she thinks she has, or maybe she can write, use that communication template and see if she can work on that problem with the other party, with the retailer, and get it resolved before she ever needs to escalate it, before she needs to pay a fee, file a dispute, bring it into a formal public dispute resolution process. So I think we're picking up a contain. I um, personally, uh, and many of our team feel the same way, would love to extend even further into the prevent dispute um, sort of realm. We're working on it. I think, if anything, the analytics data that we're picking up from the system, showing us where the types of problems are, um, maybe some of the trends will help us in the future get get to a, a, a more robust sort of dispute prevention approach, maybe the way we influence policies and um, change legislation, regu regulatory um, 
measures to, to sort of prevent problems before they happen. But otherwise, we'll pick up at the contain, uh, try the negotiation, the facilitation with the um, case managers and, and so on, the facilitators. We can adjudicate if we need to um, collect the user feedback. We collect it in the beginning. The tribunal also collects it at the end. Um, it acts on it. It's part of our continuous improvement process. We do um, have regular meetings where we get together with um, the team, get the um, look at the data that's coming in, look at the complaints or questions that are coming in to the tribunal staff, and figure out what we should do about it, and then um, work it into um, some sort of solution, whether it's technology or information, and uh, so on. Well, that I'll just leave. Um, we're, we're, we, we can wrap up um, here. What I, well, I'll leave you guys off with you. This is going to be diff difficult for you to see, but it's a look at a web form that we've built that can pick up at the end of a um, solution explorer exploration. So we've done the diagnosis information self-help. This is sort of the streaming thing. So this web form can pick up what the diagnosis was and what the user said they they wanted. In this case, it has to do with uh, an employment dispute. It can collect the user's information and then it can pass it off to another system. So we're trying to figure out ways where we can make the Solution Explorer interact with other systems, with existing systems. So um, imagine if, if you have an electronic system that um, we are able to interface the Solution Explorer with. Imagine that it could handle a lot of the sort of first basic steps uh, for an organization on intake, where by the time the, um, the issue comes to you, you already know what it's about. You already have some of the user's information. You know how the user wants to be served, and you can kind of hit the ground running and and um, before before you even start to reach out to that person. So it could look something like this, where that, that diagnosis is done, the information has been given to the user about their dispute, maybe some self-help. If it were a legal aid or a um, sort of a pro bono organization, it could pre-qualify the user. If you can imagine questions in the Solution Explorer that would uh, pre-qualify somebody in terms of their income and eligibility. Uh, we can figure out what their service preference is. Hey, I want you to phone me, I want you to email me, or I just want to come in in person. You can collect their um, basic personal information that you're going to need to open your file in your case management system anyways. Uh, maybe it can pass the user into a document assembly tool, uh, maybe a separate document assembly tool where it gets a document ready so that by the time they come and interact with your system, or by the time you're reaching out to them based on their information, you um, you have a lot of work done already. And again, so can figure out how as an organization to allocate your resources. So uh, what I will say is if there's anybody who's interested in talking to us about this sort of thing, um, please reach out and um, contact us. Sorry, I didn't put up a slide with the email or anything, but you can maybe um, uh, reach out through LSN Tap or uh, I don't know, find me on Twitter or something. We um, it it is something our team is is still interested in doing is working with other organizations to at least get to the imagination stage of how can we link to other systems and and other processes because um, it is an approach that we believe in uh, and and we're still learning about uh, ways we can we can apply and and, and make it better the um, as you may have seen on an earlier slide it's all built on the Salesforce platform so it's all built in the cloud both the modules the solution Explorer and the DRS and um, so it is offered on a licensed basis that's how we designed it so that any other organization who comes on, they don't have to do a massive tech project and do a sort of one-off scratch build. Uh, rather, they would go through an onboarding process and um, um, basically pay by licenses. But what we do have is the um, ability as well to set up sandboxes where in some cases we may, may not need licenses and we can do some small experiments um, with this sort of thing. So I'm going to stop there. James, do you have anything to add before we sort of uh, start in on the questions? Uh, no, that's, that's great. Thanks, Darren. I think there was just one, uh, there was a, a question um, that was there specifically about um, licensing and, and whether it would be available for other jurisdictions. Um, I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, 
as Darren kind of mentioned, and as I sort of alluded to, we, we built them as um, modular applications. Um, also, we know we've built them at the moment for a couple of tribunals in, in BC in the case of the Solution Explorer and um, the Civil Resolution Tribunal in the case of the Dispute Resolution Suite. But from day one, they've always been designed and architected as um, as applications that would be usable both uh, in other tribunals in BC, other geographies and other jurisdictions. So um, features can be easily configured and turned off um, as needed. As Darren said, it's it's built in the cloud, so it is highly configurable. And, you know, we, we'd love the opportunity to work with, with others. But, um, you know, for, for now, uh, yeah, let's jump into the rest of those, uh, those other questions because I think we've got about 15 minutes. Yeah, what, what else, just to, to add, uh, to, to sprinkle some sugar on, on uh, your last answer there too, James. I mean, if any of you have, have been involved in big tech projects, especially justice tech projects, they can be kind of scary and um, they can go on for years. And uh, often it ends up that you're stuck with a legacy system. So you, by the time you implement, your system's already a little bit out of date and it's very quickly you, you uh, realize or you learn that the, the system is um, too old to justify further investment for upgrading and it's too expensive to replace. So you end up getting boxed in in a, in a corner. So what the BC government was trying in this case was building something on um, an existing sort of structure and that is um, Salesforce on the assumption that it was going to be um, kept current anyways. The underlying platform was always going to be upgraded, uh, kept current, you know, because the, it's a big market. It's a, it's a lot of users using the system anyways. And then so a lot of the um, custom sort of justice uh, processes or code, I guess, that that um, we, we felt would be helpful for a court or a tribunal were just um, built on top of that. The CRT have exclusive jurisdiction over small claims under 5,000, or can other parties still use the small claims court as before? Uh, on that uh, point, I'll just say really, um, I'll give a really short answer if I can, is yeah, yes, you should consider it exclusive, but a person can apply to be exempted from the process. So they can, uh, they can apply to basically go to court instead if they want. I don't have numbers on those. I think the n they would be incredibly small, though, like less than five or something where, where I think that's happened. Uh, next is, have you done a return on investment uh, analysis on this? Uh, I don't, what, what, we would have done it from a different sort of perspective, um, hmm, not like a post ROI sort of thing, but we would have done it on a business case. Um, yeah. Hopefully that, I'm answering sort of the, the same sort of question. Uh, we, we would have done a treasury board submission is what we call it, where we have to ask the government funder um, to, to fund the, the initiative. And what we would do is, is show the cost benefit sort of analysis for years one to three and, uh, you know, the medium term and then the longer term, where the bottom line on this is um, from a dollars and cents sort of perspective is we're trying to build something that um, from a public taxpayer sort of perspective is going to be more sustainable in the future. And um, so the cost savings would come around not having, you know, um, a, t a, a large number of full-time judges. Uh, instead, again, we use the, the tribunal members who in many cases can be part-time sort of thing, only, only called on when, when they're needed, um, not having bricks and mortar. So it's a, the tribunal has two small offices um, but that's not really their service model. Again, the service model is in the cloud and, and remote sort of um, delivery. Some of the staff who work uh, do work remotely. Again, we have people who live on small islands sort of located between Victoria and Vancouver who work for the tribunal. And some of the staff works in the offices, some work in, in other places. So those all sort of feed into it. So do, do we think I got close I on that? I think I got it pretty well, though. I do believe I... What I read, I believe there was even like um, analysis on about how much driving and emissions were saved using this method compared to having to drive people around. Yeah, yeah, there was one uh, report. Uh, I think it was Noam Ebner and Kathy Tate, a paper. If anybody is looking for it, and I think it did um, go in a little deeper on on the emissions sort of thing. I don't think anybody's done any actual sort of a quantitative analysis based on the on the CRT, but. Uh, it's certainly something I'm interested in. 
Yeah. And Darren, if we go back to the the strategic objectives of um, tribunal transformation in BC, you know, it wasn't a, as you say, in, in the business case, it wasn't a purely dollars and cents discussion. It was about, um, you know, transforming the way users interact with, with the justice system. It was about access to justice. It was about um, freeing up judges' time. Um, the CRT did do some analysis after about six months of, of running on the, the Solution Explorer and the DRS um, and applied some um, some sort of parametrics around, you know, what the average cost of legal advice would be and a number of cases and those sorts of things. And I think that the finding was that it was absolutely meeting expectations of, of the investment, but it wasn't, uh, yeah, it's not something we've been publishing because it wasn't one of the key drivers for, for transformation. Okay. Oh, this is a small question. So Strata, is that just like a condo or is that different yeah. in some subtle way? Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. So it's it, uh, there are a few Canadian jurisdictions who have Strata. I think there's some in Australia um, who, who call it Strata. But yeah, it's a certain type of ownership that um, it's, it's a very sort of regulated regime. Um, we have an, a legislation called the Strata Property Act, which is uh, very detailed. Um, let me see if there's an as easy sort of generic way I can describe it. It's like a corporate form of ownership. So say your building is Strata Corporation VIS 0328. There is a, um, there's a, there's a, a Strata Council and that's sort of like the directors who make the decisions for the Strata Corporation. I think they would be called like HOA. Um, uh, association. Yeah, in the in the U.S., I think that might be what what they might be sort of comparable. These guys, you'd pay your strata fees every month. It would be used for regular upkeep and 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 one time sort of things. But yeah, neighbor disputes a lot in a lot of cases. So hey, the person in the unit above me is um, doing tap dancing lessons. That's not working out too well for me. The neighbor next to me, they're. Um, they're, they're smoking on their patio and it's blowing into my unit. But it can also, again, be very, um, you know, much larger things. Like the uh, strata has decided it's going to spend $3 million to replace the roof or the windows on our building. And I don't think they followed the right process under the act to um, to make the decision and go ahead with the spending. On okay, that. excellent. Um, going back a little bit, um, there's a big, you know, just, you're talking a lot about being mobile friendly. A lot of the resources, though, were in PDF form, which has historically not been the most mobile-friendly format. Is that just because that's how it is, or is, can, is there something going Can, on can I take that one, Darren? Please. You bet. Yeah, I mean, we, we did a lot of work early on um, to make sure that, particularly in the case of the Solution Explorer, that everything was mobile-friendly. Um, I, I won't talk too much about the, the kind of the web development framework we've used, but um, I think... De Darren, are you going to send out, a, we, is there going to be an opportunity for people to, to kind of test it or, or work with it? Um, yeah, I think I mean, they can just go, you can just go to the Civil yeah, Resolution Tribunal website and try it out. I encourage people to do that and have it have a try. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Um, the mobile version of Solution Explorer looks very, very similar to the one on the screen um, that Darren showed, but it's configured for mobile. The PDFs appear in a container, so they're actually quite easy to read on a phone. Now, if you download them and look at them yourself later on on a third-party app. Um, they may not be as user-friendly, but certainly when you're going through the exploration, um, they are very, very easy to see, very easy to read. Um, they work just as kind of you expect them to work on a, on a um, PC screen. Huh, very cool. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the question about PDFs in particular, it's something our team has continued to look, on, um, look at and, and figure out. We think and the future might be sort of iframe, uh, um, so more, it would look that the text in the information bulletins would would uh, or info resources would look just like regular the te the rest of the text in the system sort of thing. So um, I also didn't show you videos. So we also can build videos in. We we have done it on some other pathways where there's a video that basically you click one screen and the next thing it does is take you to a video. Uh, and then you keep going after that sort of thing. So um, it is something that that we're aware of and we're working on. But um, uh, it, it, it's a good it's a good question about uh, the PDFs. This is um, this is what James was just talking about. So say if I was on a mobile phone, um, just pointing out it's not a different app you you go to. It's not a different URL you go to. It's just all responsive design. So. Um, I can still go through my screens. I can still answer my questions. The progress bar is still there. It's just um, being moved off to the side and so on. 
and uh, a lot the other functions are all still there as as somebody who's been involved in this since you know 2012 or so when we started i can tell you that um in a lot of cases the first screens the team would see when when you know something new was coming up here's what the the designers the developers working on a lot of times the first screens we all looked at were the mobile screens uh, we didn't start off with the big full desktop screens in 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 all cases. Do you think this type of process would translate well to remote workshops offered by our court's self help units? Yeah, I I, I think so. I don't, I don't really see there's a, as being many limits to um to to where the, this can be applied or at least tried. I mean, we don't. To be honest, we never know until we try. But that's something our team is, has always done is trying to go off and, and do the prototype, give it a try sort of thing. So, um, which again, if anybody wants to talk to me at that, about that, we're, we're still looking for new ways to, new applications and so on. Um, what I imagine is something like the Solution Explorer can provide a lot of the self-help. It can carry some of the load, um, helping users figure out what they need to do for the core process. Um, I didn't show you in, in the pathway that we, we went down, but we have prototyped some pathways that do basically say, it has the answer, what do you want to do next? And the user says, I want to go to court. And so we'll take them into uh, information that they need to know about getting ready for the court process. And I think we can integrate um, without a huge uh, amount, amount of um, struggling, we can integrate it with the document assembly tool, which would be there, you know, filling out the court form. Or the system could even collect it, uh, collect the information that's needed in a court form, and it could um, produce it in something that looks like the court form. So, certainly, um, can be uh, the intermediary in, in in those cases, at least in my opinion. We haven't done it here, but we we can um, we can imagine it. Uh, does all of BC have a unified court system? Uh, no, it's not quite. Um, it's 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 different than the than the U.S. and um, um, other Commonwealth. They all have seem to have their own um, systems. But in the U.S., we have a uh, provincial court, which is um, it does most of our you know our small claims, a lot of our criminal work, a lot of our family work. Uh, but then we have a superior court, what we call it here, Supreme Court of British Columbia, and um, they handle. Um, higher, they tend to handle higher, m m more serious or um, higher value disputes sort of thing. Um, there's still a trial court. And then we have a court of appeal as well here in the province. Excellent. I think we're running out of time. Do you have anything else you'd like to say before we close this out? Um, no, I just want to uh, say uh, thanks to LSN Tap again for organizing and hosting it. We really appreciate it. We love talking about this stuff, as I'm sure you guys can tell. And um, so, thanks for the opportunity to do that. Um, don't don't be afraid to reach out. Again, I think um, we can make our contact information available uh, for everybody if if they wanna if they wanna ask us more questions or um, get into an imagination sort of session with us. We'd be happy. Uh, to engage in that and um, don't I would just say to people any of the other I mean I, I don't want to just focus on the technology here if anybody wants to talk about some of the other things like user centered um, processes uh, user experience design collecting information from your users as you go building it into a continuous improvement process um, focusing on an alternative dispute resolution based sort of um, process uh, any, any of, any and all of that, we would be happy to talk about. So, uh, and we'd lo we'd love to hear from you. So, thanks again for for everybody for tuning in, uh, and thanks to LSN Tap for for hosting.